let's get started. Um, so we're writing equations of lines. Typically, we like to write lines like equations of lines like this. So we like to write equations of lines in this form. Yeah? Where do you find where you like put up the recording of what we do in the class? Because I went to your website yeah. and clicked on both of them. And the newest one was like 10 months ago on the YouTube link. You have to scroll down. The newest ones go to the bottom. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. I know it would be nicer if they were the top, but it would require me to go and drag it from the bottom to the top every time. Okay. Because it by default puts them at the bottom. So, yeah, you have to look at the bottom. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, we like to write it like this. We like to write it in what kind of form is this called? Slope intercept is what it is, okay? Uh, what is this? With the whisper that exasperated me as well, Carl? Slope and what? Y intercept. Okay, so we have the slope and the y intercept. On a, on a scale of 1 to 5, how difficult is it to write the equation of this line given this information? Like a 1. 50. Like a 1. Uh, 50. I was joking. Wow. Okay. We're going to have issues, aren't we? We're going to have words at some point. Okay. That's all right. Y equals M, which is negative 5. We see that. Times X plus B, which we know is negative 1. So it's done. Okay, well. If it could all be that easy, that would be great. But that won't necessarily be the case. I'm going to move all this stuff. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So now they give us a point. Is that useful? Yeah. Yes. It is. What is the deal with that? It's so funny. That's just a good, funny day. Uh, well, there's a point on the line that's certainly useful if we want to write an equation about this line, like write an equation for this line. Okay. Uh, and by telling us that it's perpendicular to this line, what information are they leading us towards about this line? The line that goes to this point. It's about the same slope. Okay, so it's about the slope. Is it the same slope? As this line. If it had the same slope, what would this say? It would say parallel. Perpendicular. Oh, oh, oh. Right, right. Perpendicular. So perpendicular lines don't have the same slope, they have what kind of slope? Opposite. Opposite reciprocal. So what's the slope of this line right here? Four. Four. Four over one, right? So what's the slope? of that line that goes to the point that I underlined in pink. Opposite, reciprocal. Very good. So now we've been given a point and a slope. Is that enough? Is that all we need? Yep. Okay. It's enough to get there, right? How do we get there? How do we get to the equation y equals mx plus b? and get a second point, what will that do for us? When you can put it into like the y2 minus y1. And, and when we do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, what will that give us? Oh, just the end of that slope. Yeah, but it would give us a slope, we have a slope right there. Okay, but, that, you know, double checking, maybe, double checking that the slope is right. Um, So Misty's using the point slope form because we have a point and we have a slope. And the point slope form, it's not it's not this, right? It's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 in parentheses. So the y1 and the x1 are a y1 and x1 from a point. We leave these others, this y and this x, as the variables. So y minus what? Negative one equals m, which we just talked about, is negative 1 fourth times x minus 3. So y plus 1 equals negative 1 fourth x plus 3 fourths. 
coefficient because it's distributed this negative one fourth. Y equals negative one fourth and X what? What happened to this one? Subtracted one minus one fourth. Three fourths minus a fourth is or three fourths minus one is negative one fourth. So there we go. There's the equation for the line that goes through three negative one perpendiculars to this other line. Okay. Now, this might be where we call Michael and ask him what we can do with these two points. Draw the y2 minus y1. There you go. You use the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Y2 minus y1, it doesn't really matter which is the first point and which is the second. 8 minus negative 2 over, so if you use 8 first, we use negative 3 first, negative 3 minus negative 5. 8 plus 2 is 10, over negative 3 plus 5 is 2, so 5. The slope is 5. Now that we got the slope is 5, now what can we do? Same thing as we did for this one, right? Point slope form, okay. And just so that we see a variety of ways, uh, is there another way that we can do it? Do we have to use point slope form? It's the law, the land. Do we have to use the point slope form? Michael? I'm a little off on the last step of the last one. From here to there? Yeah. Uh, well, you can see the, the main difference is that there's not a one right here, right? Yeah. So we subtracted one from both sides. Okay, so it was negative one fourth x plus three fourths. Then we subtracted one from that three fourths. Three fourths minus one would be negative one fourth. Oh, okay. <coughs> um, so do we have to use a point slope form just because we have a point and a slope? Is that what we have to do? We have to do that. We have to do it? Is that what we must do? Do we have to do that? No, okay, we don't have to do that. What can we do otherwise? You don't want to see me drop to the ground and, and throw a tantrum up here because you're not participating. Michael? You can graph two points and draw a line and count up. Um, what will that be for us? Did you slope? Uh, there it is right there. Yeah, but didn't you just ask if there was another way to do that? Oh, another way to find the slope. Yeah. Certainly, yes, you could find the slope that way. But is there, what, what I'm saying is one way to find the equation is to use point slope form, plug in those things, solve for y. But there's another way, if we choose to do so, another way to find the equation of the line. How might that go? Use the slope-intercept form yep. and plug in point. And then we'll, we'll see what happens when you do that. Well, um, this one has a positive. I like using positive numbers, so we'll use that one. So y equals mx plus b. y, which is 8, equals m, which is 5, times x, which uh, the x that goes with 8 is negative 3, plus we don't know yet b, right? So we're going to solve for b, and then we can put it back in. So this is another option. So we get a negative 15, we add 15 to both sides, we get 23 equals b, and y equals 5x plus 23, because we just found b. So I like that we're recalling the point slope form. That's pretty cool. Uh, and we could also use the slope intercept form and solve for b. All right, so. That's uh, the, the quiz for 2.4, right? Not 2.5 yet. Are there any questions on any of those three? Okay. So on to 2.5, that was about direct variation. And there's something really specific about uh, if x and y vary directly. What does that mean? If x and y vary directly, what does that mean? Some number times x does not y. Exactly. Some number, we'll call it a, because that's what the book calls it, times x is equal to y. y equals a times x. y equals a times x plus what? Zero. Zero, Zero right? So if we were to look at the graphs of these direct variation equations, they all do what? All these lines do what? We have a plus zero for all of them. 
go through the origin. They have a y-intercept of 0. They would go through the origin. Okay. So if y and x vary directly, this is true. If this is true, y and x vary directly. It's you know back and forth. One implies the other. So if we want to show that this is direct variation, how can we go about doing that? OK, so you're ultimately, I'm thinking, getting y by itself. OK? And then what? Divide by 2. Divide by 2. y equals 5 halves x. Is that a number times x equals y? Yeah. Yes, it is. Is that direct variation? Yeah. Yes, it is. Even if it's a fraction, that's fine. Again, if this, if this data shows direct variation, then we can take x, multiply it by a number, and get y. Will that work? What do you multiply this by to get negative 1? Negative 1 third. OK, let's see if negative 1 third keeps working. 6 times negative 1 third? 9 times negative 1 third? 12 times negative 1 third? Yeah. Um, another way to think about it, if y equals the number times x, then we could divide both sides by whatever a is. We get y, or sorry, not, we don't want to do a. We want to find a. So we could divide by x, and y divided by x should always give you that constant of variation a. So we take y divided by x, negative 1 third. Negative 1 third, negative 3 divided by 9, simplifies negative 1 third, negative 1 third, negative 1 third, and we divide y by x another idea. Okay. Any questions from any part of the homework whatsoever? Yes, Abby? Um, number 50 on 2.4. Which one? 2.4. 4, number 50. Look at that. Right there. Okay. You buy a car for $6,500. The monthly cost of owning the car, including insurance, fuel maintenance, and taxes, averages of $350. You write an equation that models the total cost of buying and owning the car. Okay. Meaning, well, obviously, this is a, we're going to construct a function, an equation. Right? Uh, and how much we pay. How much we pay at some point in the future is dependent on what? What's going to happen for you to pay more and more and more for this car? Monthly cost. So, the, so the, the, the amount that I pay per month total has to go up, right? Well, not, not per month, but there is a fixed cost per month, and so to pay more money, we would have to own this car for some number of months. Right? So months have to go by. So how much we pay is determined by how long we own it. How much we pay is a function of how long we own the car in months. So that, that wording is, is a nice one to understand because it gets used a lot in math. So the cost is a function of the number of months. The cost is a function of the number of months. So cost is equal to, right? You can do this. You know, if you if you own the car for zero months, right, you just bought the car, how much has the car cost you so far? Yeah. Sixty five hundred dollars. If you own it for one month, how much is it costing you after one month? It's what? Six thousand eight hundred and fifty? Six thousand eight hundred and fifty. And then if we own it for another month? We would add two times 350, right? And then if we add it for three months, three times 350. So what kind of a, an equation can we write? And we can plug in the number of months and get the cost. Michael? Uh, C equals 350x plus 5500. Our initial cost, when, when we haven't owned it for any amount of time, we just bought it, and we haven't driven it anywhere, and we haven't put insurance on it, and we haven't done anything but just paid for it, $6,500, OK? Well, that's our y-intercept, right? If we were to graph this, that'd be our y-intercept. That's where you start at time zero. Okay? And then as each month passes, we could use x, we could use m if we wanted to, to represent months. Uh, we add on $350 for every month that goes by. That's 
Seven months go by, seven times 350, added to $6,500. Seven months go by, seven times $350, added to $6,500. Any more questions? Yes. 25 on 25. 25 on 25. <coughs> Wait a minute. Wait, 2.5? What am I? I'm at 2.4. Okay. That's why I'm. So the variables x and y vary directly. That's what they're telling you. So if the variables y and x vary directly, what are they saying about the relationship between y and x? What do you know right away? Michael? Y or a equals a times x. <coughs> okay, so if they vary directly, then y equals a, a times x. And also, y is 8, so 8 must be equal to a times negative 6. So this is the definition of direct variation. If they say direct variation, this, if you look it up in the dictionary, this is all you see. That's what it means. Okay? Um, so, uh, write an equation that relates x and y. Find x when y is negative 4. So, what they're looking for is this with a and into it. We know what a is. Can we find what a is? How are we going to solve for a here? Have a negative six. Have a negative six. We get negative four thirds. A. So the equation. We fill in negative four thirds for a. We get y equals negative four thirds x. Then it says find x when y. Find x when y is negative four. Negative four for y. Negative four thirds for a. And how are we going to find x? How do we get x by itself? Multiply by the reciprocal of negative four thirds, multiply by negative three fourths. Multiply. multiply this by negative three fourths. Okay, this is negative four over one. Fourths can cancel. Negative times negative is positive. So x equals three. <coughs> okay, good. Any other questions? Thirty on here, on 2.5. Give an example of two real life quantities that show direct variation. Well, here's direct variation. Y equals A times X. And this is a constant. So what real life example can you come up with where you just take the variable, you know, whatever that thing is, and you just multiply it by the same number for whatever variable, and it gives you something new that's useful. Some thought. Could be a miles per gallon. So what's a, what's a miles per gallon we might get? 23. 23. Realistic. Very good. 23 miles per gallon. Okay. So that could be a constant that you multiply something by. What would you multiply that by? Michael? 16, 16 what? Like gallon. Gallon, so your car, as it when its tank is full, right, is 16 gallons. Some, some cars hold that much, or trucks. So we multiply that by gallons. What will that tell us? Michael? How many miles you can go? How many miles you can go, right? So if you want to take a trip, and you want to know how much you're going to spend on gas, how many miles it goes, how many miles per hour gallon you get, and you know how many gallons you're going to have to use. <coughs> or if you know how many gallons will fit in your tank, you can figure out how far you can go in a, a single tank of gas. So that fits this one, y equals a times x. Y, the number of miles, 
equals uh, a 22 miles per gallon times x, the number of gallons. x and y and u a right here. There's one. Right? Nothing else to do. Just multiply those two numbers together, and you can find the miles that you're that, that number of gallons can take you. What else? What's one more example? miles per hour, so let's say 60 miles per hour. All right, 60 miles per hour, so what? What are we going to do with that? Hours. What's that? Uh, hours. What about hours? What are you going to do with that number of hours? Uh, multiply. multiply it by 60 miles per hour. And what will that tell you? How long you're gonna travel? You already know how long you're gonna travel. <laughs> how far you're gonna travel? How far you're gonna travel? Miles. There's our x. There's our a. There's our y. There's these are all over the place. Too. You want to convert inches to feet? You can multiply it by a single number. Right, the conversion ratio from inches to feet is multiplied by one twelfth. Or vice versa, or you can, you know, here's a really, right? This is the one we just used. Distance equals rate times time. D equals RT. Uh, there's a lot of direct variation in our life. And it's mostly just converting one thing to another. Converting gallons into miles, miles into gallons, uh, hours into miles, centimeters into meters. A lot of these things take the form of conversion in our everyday life. Right? Anything else? You have a question? 38. 38 and 2.5. Okay, the time it takes T, time T, it takes the diver to ascend safely to the surface, varies directly with the depth D. So to shorten that up, we could say T varies directly with D. Okay, so what does that mean about T and D? We write a relationship between T and D before we even get any further into this problem? <coughs> T equals what? AD. Yeah, there's some constant that when you multiply it by your depth, you get how much time you should take at a minimum to rise to the surface safely. Um, so we are saying it takes a minimum of 0.75 minutes for a safe ascent from the depth of 45 feet. Write an equation that relates D and T. So again, it takes 0.75 minutes, three quarters of a minute, to rise safely from a depth of 45 feet. So we're going to do that information. People who are falling asleep might help to participate. Just throw an answer out there. Move us right along. Point seven five minutes, right? In, that's the uh, time, a measurement of the time that goes by. Equals a times forty five feet. Solve for a. Divide point seven five by forty five. That equals a, which is one third. Where's the Kevin? Kevin. Michael. Is it exact 1.6? No, there's like a bunch of sixes and then a seven. Okay, so your calculator just rounded that last six up to a seven, but it's sixes forever. Ever and ever. 
Uh, but here, let's, let's write that for the, the sake of time. Okay, can we write an equation that will now take any depth and turn it into a safe rising time? Yeah, Michael? Y equals uh, 1.6 times x for b. All right, t equals 1.6 for p and b. That works too. And then it says to find, to find the, uh, the time for a safe ascent from a depth of 100 feet. Mr. Yes? 0.75 divided by 40. Yes? It's 1 over 60. 0.016. 0.016. Repeating? Is it, it's got to be repeating. And then repeating? Yeah. And then and it's 1 over 60. The fraction, which I like. I like the fraction. It's exact. 1 over 60. So that's what we're going to put up here. Yeah. Okay. Right. We got that figured out. Um, find the safe rising time from a depth of 100 feet. What do we do? Multiply what? By 60. Multiply 100 by 60. What about 1 over 60? Yeah? Okay. 1 over 60. Okay, 100 over 60, uh, so 10 over 6, 5 thirds, <coughs> 5 thirds of a minute. Let's pass it around. Focus here is we're going to be learning about how changing the equation of a function changes the graph of that function, how it transforms that function into other things. Uh, it, it might uh, stretch it, shrink it, move it, flip it, something. Right? So um, this function is y equals what? It's what? Absolute value of x. Absolute value. Yeah. What's the absolute value? I mean, what's the absolute value of a number? Distance away from zero. Yes. Distance away from zero. So what's the absolute value of negative three? Three. It's three away from zero. And the absolute value of seven? Seven, because it's seven away from zero. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. And what I'm gonna wonder, you know, as I as I walk around is, is do you guys know how to graph? Uh, Basic way. Do you know how to do that as well? Because you might think that you did it. Okay. Um, so that's what I want to find out. I want to find out how good are you at graphing? Do you understand what a graph is, and uh, how to translate it into a graph? So all I want you to do is graph this function. Close your books. I don't know why I told you to open your books. Close your books. It's my fault. Close your books. Close your books. Okay. So I don't want you to look ahead and just uh, you know give it away to yourself. All right, so we're going to graph this function, y equals absolute value of x. So I'm putting that to you, whatever that means to you. If you got a good idea of where to start, you should start there. If you don't, I'm going to come around and, and see how you do it. So go for it. Do as much as possible. Look at your papers. Graph this. Graph this. Graph this. Graph this. Y equals the absolute value of x. What? Okay. <laughs> start by drawing an x and y axis. Thank you. 
If you don't know where to start, where if you if you have never seen a function before and you don't know what the graph looks like, like you know that certain equations will turn out to look like lines when you graph them. But I don't know what this is gonna look like, and that's the point of me saying graph this. Okay, it's where you do not know what it's going to look like. If you don't know what a function is gonna look like, you should ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna just say, hey, it looks like this shape, go do this, this, that's not helpful, right? You can ask yourself, right? What does a function do? What is a function's purpose? You tell me, I'm asking you this question. What? Nothing. What's a function do? <laughs> what does a function do? Graph. It shows I put an output. Functions takes things in and takes yeah, those things that go in and turns them into things that go out, right? Takes input and turns them into output, right? So maybe do that a few times. Do an input and then an output and another input and another output and another input and another output and see how that looks. Did you look at his? You should probably look at it. You should look at it. Okay, well you should do it. I don't I know. I, I did what I thought was right. Yeah, we did. So there's a dot in the middle. Kevin and I. And a negative one. And a negative one. That was not going to be right. Let me see what it's like this. One where it seems like you don't know what the answer is. But I wouldn't ask you to do something that you couldn't at least get part of the answer, make a guess at the answer, right? <clears throat> and making a guess at the answer when it seems like you have no idea is better than waiting around until I come and tell you what it's supposed to look like and show you the steps you're grabbing. Okay? What you gain out of this class is, is much less the knowledge of what the graph of this looks like. I mean, who cares, really? Who not cares? Me. Not you, not me. I'm with you. Okay? 
<laughs> it's a, for one, it's a state standard, okay? And also, the thing you really get out of it, not the shape of the graph, but the opportunities that you have when I give you a question or a task like, graph this thing, okay? Do you apply what you know? Do you put down just the, the slightest bit step more, right? Do you take the smallest step forward that you possibly can? Even feeling like, I don't think this is gonna get me the answer. But do you try? Or do you sit there and wait for somebody to come along and tell you how to do it? Okay? If, if you're gonna get raises in your job, and your, your, your boss is gonna notice you, it's gonna be because you took the initiative when a problem presented itself to take at least the smallest step forward, right? Without ruining something, okay? You don't wanna try and drive a forklift maybe if you don't know how to drive a forklift and crash into walls and things. But what job are you talking about? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, driver guy. Okay, but if there's something that you can try, if there is a guess that you can make, if there's a step that you can take forward, rather than just standing still in the middle of a, an office building and just waiting for somebody to come along and take your hand and hold it and show you where to go, okay? make some kind of a step forward. So these are the opportunities. And here's like one of the first ones. And, it, and your, your approach to future problems could make all the difference, at least for the rest of this year in this class. If you just start making an attempt, the next step, you'll be better off than the person who says, I don't know, so uh, I know he's gonna tell me, so I'll just wait around until he tells me. Okay? It's much better to create that knowledge than wait for the knowledge to be spooned into your mouth. Okay? So, with that said, can you show me what you think a graph is? Like, how could in any way you translate this thing onto a graph, right? Show me something, right? Try again. Show me something. Show me anything that you can try. It takes information from that equation and puts it on the graph, okay? Give it a shot. Anything. <laughs> Individually, go ahead. Don't look at me anymore unless I come up and look at you first. <laughs> Some really nice. Some really weak. Okay. Uh, let's either remind ourselves or maybe learn for the first time exactly what we're even talking about. What a graph is. Now, it's not unfair for me to expect that you know the basics of graphs. Okay. Uh, but maybe it didn't fully take hold or whatever, so we're just gonna refresh, or we're gonna rejuvenate your knowledge. All right. So we're here. Let's see. Oh man, it's the machine again. Oh no. Okay. The factory. So it's a factory. The factory is an, an analogy for a function. Okay. Uh, and I've, I've added a loading dock here. It's, I thought that was a nice addition. There's a loading dock there. That's where stuff goes in. And this is where stuff comes out. Okay? Um, so we'll use our function as, as, this, as this factory. Okay? It's the absolute value of x is what this factory does. It gives you the absolute value of x. X is just a letter we use to represent most often the thing that goes into the function. Okay? So that's where we could start, unless we didn't quite understand that that's what graphs are. Okay? We could start by putting something in and seeing what comes out. Okay? And if you don't immediately say, like, oh, I get it, I see why I would do that and how that could help me graph it, okay? maybe you didn't fully understand graphs. And that wouldn't be uh, a new thing that wouldn't be surprising and it wouldn't be you know, particularly your fault, right? Um, but here it's coming again and I'm gonna try and explain it as clearly as possible, right? So there's this factory and things are going in and things are coming out, okay? Um, and then there's this guy, okay? 
<laughs> he works the back, he's got a little hard hat. Actually, he's got a bright vest. Okay, he's safe. He's safe. He's safe. He's safe. He's safe. Okay. 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 Okay, and then oh, this is an article now. That's pretty neat. So it's working out there. There it is. Okay, and this guy has a clipboard. Okay, he's got that clipboard. And what's this guy's job? It's to look at the stuff that goes in. Okay, and make a note of that, and then also make a note of the thing that comes out after that thing goes in. Okay, this is is like everything about graphs right now. And so let's take a look at what he might put down on this clipboard. Actually erase this stuff. See what he might write down on this clipboard as things go into the function and as things come out of the function. And how he might write those things down. Okay? So what's something we can put into this factory? Three. It's just like three. three. The number three. Okay. And what comes out? Three. Three comes out. All right, so this guy just saw this happen. Okay, he just saw three go in to this absolute value of x factory function, uh, and he wants to keep track of this. Okay, so what's a way he can keep track of this? Michael? You make like a table, and then make like a table. input and output. Input and output. Right, he could let x be the thing that represents in, and y represents what came out. So if x, the thing that went in was 3, he saw a 3 come out. And so there's one way to represent that. Okay. What's another way? Right? And you can see this table. We can keep filling it out. Like uh, a negative 2 could go in there. A negative 2 could go right in there. And what would come out? Two. Two. A 2. And he could write that down. Negative 2 goes in and 2 comes out. Okay. He could keep filling that table out for all the inputs and outputs until he ran out of paper or ink or something. What's another way? Okay, let's put that at the end because that's like the ultimate end and the, the, the preferred way to keep track of the behavior. Not just discrete examples of what goes in and what comes out, but like the behavior of a graph and what it will do in the future and what it has done in the past and that kind of thing. Okay. So we'll leave that one to the very end. What's another way we could represent that three went in and three came out? And negative two went in and two came out. Yeah? Wait, an equation? Um, an equation, yes, certainly that equation uh, is a way to represent the function. Um, but what he's keeping track of is like what actually happened, what numbers actually went in, what numbers actually came out. Uh, you could write that out. You could just say, 3 went in, and 3 came out. <coughs> I can get pretty tired. Sound like they yeah. didn't get any money. Huh? It does sound like they did a whole lot. 3 went in, 3 came out. Yeah. They didn't bad factor. They, didn't they just kind of pushed it down the rollers, and it yeah. went out the door on the other side. <laughs> didn't do a whole lot. Um... Okay, so three went in, three came out, negative two went in, two came out. Um, but that, that would take quite a while, right? For you to, and if things are happening quickly, you could lose track. Mm -hmm. So that, that might not be the best way, but it certainly is a way. It is a way to show that. Uh, any other ways that you can think of? Just ways to show this number went in and this number came out. Yeah? Like three arrow three? Sure, three went in and three came out. Negative 2 went in and 2 came out. This is one that uh, actually is like in the book and it's common and it has a name, right? It's called a mapping diagram. We talked about this before, didn't we? Oh, yeah. We talked about functions, how we represent them. Yeah. Okay. But just to make room, it's, it's that. What Carl said is it's valid as any other way of keeping track of it, but it does take up a lot of room, so maybe we'll, we'll favor something that takes less room. How about we just put a parentheses and a comma? Does that look familiar? 
Yeah. Now, oh, how yeah. would we fill that in? <laughs> three, 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 comma three. Negative two, comma two. We can list all those all day long. Okay. Now, here's the, the limitation of, of all of these. They take up a lot of room, and they take a lot of time. Say, so that was your job to write those things down. Uh, you, if then things were happening quickly, you may find yourself wanting a faster way to do this, to keep track of the things that go in and the things that come out. Right? Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay. That's what a graph is. That's all a graph. It's just an alternative to these things, or writing it down, or any other way you can keep track of what goes in versus what comes out. So really all we have is two number lines. We know number lines, right? If I were to graph three on this number line, how would I graph three on this number line right here, this horizontal one? Oh, uh, you go three spaces right on the X. From where the start? origin. From the origin, you move over one, start. two, three, and you're do what there? You didn't make a little point. Make a little point, okay? So we can mark out the tick marks on our number line. And all this vertical thing is, is a second number line. It's just the second number line. Okay. Now, it's not just three. It's not that just three happened, that x was three. But when x was three, what happened? Y it came out three. Y was three. Right? So when three went in, three came out. Okay, and now look what we have. We have one point. We have one little movement of the pen, and we've recorded three went in and three came out. Okay? As opposed to writing out this whole table, writing three and then three. And that's not too bad until you start to do a lot of these. Or you start to do a lot of these. Or you start to do a lot of this. Okay? What we do here is we, we just draw a graph, and one little point can represent this input gives this output. Input, output. We could call this the input axis, axis. We call this the output axis. A lot of times we call them x and y, but that's just because x represents input and y represents output. So now we have a much smaller space to represent uh, tons of input output pairs. So we go to negative two up to two. We do some more. One. We can do one. In goes one, out comes one, in goes one, comes out one. One goes to one. Well, on the graph, we just put one little point right there and we're done. Faster than anybody was able to write that stuff. Any of these other three options. Okay. How about negative five to five, negative five to five, negative five goes to five. And now in these three, I'm out of room. And on here on the graph, I still have lots of room for lots of input output pairs. One, two, three, four, five. That's five, one, two, three, four, five. Right about there. And I, I had no more room in these other ones. I had to erase and write smaller or give me a piece of paper or something like that. But over here I can say when I put in zero, zero comes out. And then he sees two go in and two come out. And he sees five go in and five come out. Uh, right there. Okay. He's keeping track of all this stuff in a really small amount of space, and we're able to see what this function does. Okay. So, with that analogy, I'm trying to explain to you what a graph is, what it does. And the graph of, a, of an equation is not a magical translation from one thing to another. Uh, it's simply this input gives this output. So we put a point right there. And then we put another point, another point, another point, another point. And if we were to put lots and lots of points, every point we could possibly put in here, go to negative three, go up to three, negative four, go up to four, negative one, up to one, right? We put all those points in there. What kind of shape would eventually come out of this example? Michael? Like a V. Like a V, right? We can see how there's this straight down towards the origin and then straight through these points and through all the other points that we might put on that graph or input output pairs we might see from this function. Yeah. As just noticed uh, Friday with my other Alpha 2 classes, there was more confusion about this than I had realized uh, from, from previous years. 
hope this helps. Does this clear up what a graph is? What it represents? Right? It's not just magic. It actually is very specific. It, it tells you what's going in, what's coming out of the function. Okay. So now we'll go back to here. And now we know uh, for a basic y equals the absolute value of x, if you put in a number, you just get out that same number, right? It's just got the steady one for one slope. Steady up one over one. Just like that. Back. If we go the other way, if we go into the negatives, well, all those are going to be positive. Every time we put in a negative number, the absolute value, what it does, the guys in that factory that were working, they rip off that negative side, and then they send it out the door as a positive. Right? It's kind of what they do. So the same relationship, only negative numbers turn into their positive counterparts. And then they just keep going forever in that direction. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing, to, to basically display the understanding that when I put this thing in, this is what comes out, and this is how I put that on a graph. Okay. We're going to do that several times. Are there any questions before I have you do? Lots of things like that. Like, is that one or two lines? Say again? Is that like one or two lines? Uh, I guess it depends on how you mean that. Like, um, how do you mean that exactly? Well, I don't know. Like, is it like actually a B where they just both stop at the origin, or is it like a U where there's just one continuous line? Okay. Uh, so, like if we, you're saying if we zoomed in down here really, really far, would we see some kind of a nice little swoopy curve at some point? Yeah. No, we would see an absolute, what's called a cusp. It's a corner, it's a sharp corner, there's no curve to it at all. This side comes in and then it immediately leaves, uh, you know, just like it's bouncing off of a mirror, right? No curve at all. But it is one graph, it's not two graphs. I mean, we could make the same shape by using two graphs and putting them together, but this function is, is one that exists, and this is what it does, and this is what its graph looks like. Does that make sense? Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, you hear it. You're encouraging words. I know. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> There's something else you're supposed to be here for. That's okay. Uh, all right, so I want you to do that, okay? And I want you to see and just compare what this, the graph of this looks like as compared to what this graph looks like. So they're going to look similar or there's going to be a difference and I want you to make note of what that difference is. take this function and, and we put something into it. Um, well, let's compare it to, to that one. We put in, uh, say, negative 2, 1, 0, uh, or say negative 2, negative 1, 1, and 2. Okay. And we'll look at the absolute value of x. Um, what's the absolute value of negative 2? 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. Okay. I won't make you say all this. Okay. So this function is a lot like that function, right? In fact, it, it kind of does the exact same thing as that function, but a little more. Right? If we were to draw a real simple looking factory here, right, the absolute value of x factory, that's supposed to be an x. Okay. So then in goes something into the absolute value of x factory. And out it comes, right? And this factory does that. It just takes the absolute value of x. But then it does something more. It takes that, and it adds 2 to it. So you can see how it takes the exact same outputs as the original function, but then it adds 2. Okay. So what effect is that going to have on these outputs? It makes them bigger. It makes them bigger by 2, right? It's hard to really put it to words because it's so simple. You just make it bigger by 2. So this gets made bigger by 2, you get 4, you get 3, you get 2, you get 3, you get 4. 
So let's really think about this. Let's really let's, uh, um, internalize the meaning of a graph. You got your input, which is horizontal, and your output, which is vertical. Go to your input, and then you map that to your output, and that's how a graph works. Right? Uh, and we can see how all the outputs here for this original absolute value of x function, you just added 2 to them. Right? Let's look at this guy right here at uh, 1, 1. Right? Let's call this 1, 1. Well, the input hasn't changed, right? We're still inputting one and getting out three, but so the, the input hasn't changed. But we're adding two to the output of the original function, the original uh, absolute value of x function. Right? So we see that, with that what effect that has on the number itself. What effect does it have on the graph? Like how does how does the point on this graph compare to this point right here? Yeah. Just like two more up on the y yeah. every time. If we add two to the number, we, we get two plus two is four. If we add two in the graph, like graphically, pictorially, that would mean a vertical shift of two. All these points are going to be moving up two. There's two. This point right here, you're going to add two to the output of that one. It's going to move up to this point over here. It's going to have two added to the output. That's going to move it up two. Right? All we're doing is adding 2 to the output of this function. So if that's what it looks like in a table on a graph, when you add 2 to the output, you are moving up vertically. If the output is changing, you're going to make a vertical change, and a positive change of 2 would be up 2. Okay, this is at 0. This goes up to 2. And we can draw just like that. So now that we get that, we're saying, oh, well, look, it just has the output of absolute value of x. And it's adding 2, which on the graph means it's going to go up to. Then as a shortcut, now that we've noticed that, we're going to use our um, inductive reasoning and say, ones that are like this, where I add something or I take away something to the absolute value, um, that means that if I subtract 3, how's that going to translate over to the graph? What's it going to, how's that going to affect the graph? You just start at like negative 3. So all those points, instead of moving up two, they'll move down three, right? And then the exact same shape will happen, because nothing else changes. All the points are shifted down, so I'll push down three, and so it'll have the same angle, it'll seem slow, right? all that same stuff will be the same, only everything is moved down three. Okay. So if out, you know, after you take the square root, or not the square, I say the square root a lot. After you take the absolute value, you subtract 3 or you add 2, whatever this is going to be, up and down. Just a little bit up and down. Let's see if we can make a conclusion about uh, some other change. And um, let's do this. Let's do something else. First, I'm going to write down y equals absolute value of x and graph that guy again and, and we'll compare it. It looks something like this. Nice slope of 1. Uh, y equals 3 times the absolute value of x. Do that. Graph that. And see how that looks when you compare it to y equals the absolute value of x. We're going to do the same thing. I'm going to draw a table, because I think a table is a nice visualization to help you out. So we'll look at some inputs, some outputs of the absolute value of x. Right? And then remember what's happening here is the absolute value of x is taking stuff in, going out, and then what happens to it? It's multiplied by 3. So we multiply by 3, we multiply by 3. Whatever comes in there gets multiplied by 3. Okay, and then it comes out. So the outputs of this function at the end are going to be very similar, just somewhat different. I 
negative one, or sorry, negative two, negative one, zero. One and two are good ones. One and two, one, zero. One and two. Okay. Then if we take those numbers and we multiply them by three, two times three, six. One times three, three. So that's what it looks like in the numbers. In the numbers, if you multiply them by three, you get you know, that, that number times three. That's pretty, pretty simple. Okay. Um, but it's interesting, like zero didn't change. Zero times three is still zero. So still there's a point down here. Okay, but where this is one, one, we get one, three. Okay. And where this is two, two, we get two, Four, five, six. Okay, where this is three, three. Uh, we didn't go to three, so we won't worry about that. But the same thing happens over here. We get negative one, three, negative two, six. Call that six. And if we kept graphing points, we would find that they would just fall on this straight line or this straight line in the negative direction. So in this previous example, we said. It's moving it up three or two, or it's moving it down three or whatever. What is this, when we multiply the output of this function by three, how does it change the, the graph from the orange to the red graph? Steeper, I like the word steeper. Uh, that word steeper will stay with us for a long time through calculus. Right? So rather than something like skinnier or taller or something like that, I would use the word steeper, okay? Because it has to do uh, taller and and skinnier and those kinds of things make you feel like like that function covers less area or something, but it, it doesn't. Right? Uh, it just gets there faster is all it does. It gets steeper. Okay. Um, so what if we did y equals five uh, x? Five uh, times the absolute value of x. What do you think? Five times the absolute value of x. How would that look compared to, say, the three times the absolute value of x? It would be steeper. Even steeper. Oh. Okay. How about uh, so? So even steeper than that. And how about something like y equals two thirds times the absolute value of x? How will this, if we graph it in blue, how would that? Compare to this orange graph, which is the original absolute value. Less, less steep. Less steep. I like less steep is a good description, right? Because when you put in, say, one into the absolute value of x, you get one. And you multiply that one by two thirds, which is more or is it less than one? Less. It's less. So now it's it's below one. And you put in two, and you get out two, and you multiply by two thirds, and that's less than two but still in this, this straight, like, predictable, slopey kind of way, okay? <coughs> okay, what if we did y equals absolute value of x and then compare that to y equals negative absolute value of x? Okay, we go down rather than up, right? All these positive values, the y's, that our outputs are positive, they'll be negative instead. So it'll flip it over the x-axis. Okay. Um, there's also, we could do y equals the absolute value of x plus 2. I'll leave that for your homework. See what that does, and if that follows your intuition. But just put in points and graph the, the output. Put an input and graph the output. Okay. The last thing I'm going to cover, yes, I have more. Okay, this is the extension. This is piecewise functions. Piecewise defined functions. Okay. So first, it's cut into pieces. Okay, the way we cut it into pieces. on the x-axis, we say first, the pieces are from here to that direction and from here on that direction, right? 
Uh, let's say this is 2. This is at x equals 2. What is it? Two. No, how, how could you express where we are over here? To the, to the right of 2, right? And so what kind of numbers are we dealing with over here to the right of 2? Bigger than 2. X is bigger than 2. And on this side, X is less than 2. Right? So that's the first part. So X is less than 2. X is less than 2. Or X is greater than 2. Right? So that's, that's the piece part of the piecewise divide. Okay? So that's the piecewise part. The defined part says when X is less than 2, here's what I want you to do. Here is the function that I want you to graph or use. Okay? So we could say uh, 2x minus 1 if x is less than 2. Okay? And if it's greater than 2, how about 1 half x uh, plus 3? Okay? We'll use that function if x is greater than 3. Well, this is just a line with a line except the negative 1 and the slope of 2. Negative 1. And up 2 and over 1. Up 2 and over 1. That. And this green one is just a, a line with a y intercept of 3 and a slope of 1 half, yeah? If you put it on the two lines, could it be like, like less than or equal to? That's a good point. Uh, there's the, the remainder of this discussion you can find for period 3 and period 4 on the YouTube videos, okay? Uh, have a good day.